You are about to enter the Exorcists podcast. Some audio may not be suitable for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome all to the Exorcists podcast, where truth is revealed and knowledge to battle the demonic is given. Here is the Exorcist himself, GP Haggett. Hello and welcome to the Exorcist Podcast. I'm your host, G.P. Haggart, exorcist and theologian uh, and author. Uh, speaking of uh, authorship, I just recently finished up a book. It's been out for a little while now. If you're on Amazon or any other, any other bookstore, uh, feel free to go grab it. Um, it is called Serial Killers and Their Demons. A while ago, a friend of mine uh, had... Uh, it challenged me to uh, evaluate some of the popular serial killers, and so I did. And uh, he's like, well, you've been done, done a lot of exorcisms, so you know, why don't you uh, go through them and, and determine how they got their demons. So I'm like, all right. And I did, and I uh, wrote a book about it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that will help you to uh, go through and, you know, uh, I know what that Serial serial killers are kind of a popular subject in the paranormal community, and and uh, so if you get a chance, go grab a copy and uh, check it out. Also, uh, pretty soon here, uh, my next book, the Mechanics of Angelology, uh, will be out soon, and uh, you'll be able to get that. So once that's uh, announced, announced, I'll, I'll uh, have. A link in the descriptions and even all these books uh, um, that I'm talking about today. Um, kind of an, enough of that, though. But what I kind of want to get into on this podcast is more of <clears throat> talking about the new show, Legion of Exorcist. And a lot of you out there have asked me to review it. Didn't really want to, but uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm doing it. And um, because uh, I feel like I need to because there's some things in there that, are, that are need to be addressed. Let me just say one thing first, that a lot of what the Catholic Church does, what their interpretation of demonic possession is, is what the Protestant or evangelical church would define as possession. Um, what it, what it um, more, more or less what we would define as an extreme, extreme possession. So to, to the Protestant church, uh, evangelical church, you know, we do some digging on people's backgrounds and we can find something. <clears throat> Whereas the Catholic church doesn't really do that. They'll do minor deliverances. You know, they call it different degrees like obsession, uh, oppression, that kind of thing. Um, they don't believe that the demon is actually in the person, but yet the evangelical church does. And um, I've seen it. You know, whereas somebody would say, well, this person is, it's just oppression. That's, not, that's nothing big. Whereas according to my experience, no, they're in there. They're just trying to break the person down slowly until they can get what the Catholics would define as full-on possession. It's possession, it's just called something differently in the Catholic Church. So let's just get that out of the way. Um, because demons, they don't, they got to be attached to something or someone. And they, I mean, there's just a lot of, that's just another thing I want to get into too real quick is, the the myths of demons and demonic possession, which we'll get into also with uh, reviewing the the show Legion of Exorcist. 
First, and one question to get out of the way. Some of you have asked me, uh, would I make an appearance on the Legion of Exorcists? Yeah, I would. Somebody's got to re represent Christ. Um, to be straight up front, I, I found only two of all of the six exorcists on the, on the show credible. Their stories I found very credible. The others I, I didn't so much. The one question I have is, okay, if it's a it's a show on an exorcist called Legion of Exorcists, then why is there a demonologist there? I have no idea. I don't know why that happens. I mean, there are, it's very minor that demonologists would do exorcisms. Um, they're more investigating, getting the evidence and to, to conv convince a um an exorcist that there's something going on because a, a true exorcist uh, like myself we have an objective diagnosis we th we're not going to believe something until the devil shows up and that that to a degree can be different across the board in orthodox christianity catholic christianity and protestant christianity um so i i have seen all six episodes <clears throat> I wasn't impressed uh, because, well, I, I, me personally, I love doing deliverance and exorcisms because it, it it's not the fear factor at all. It's the fact that God shows up, and I can't wait for that. God shows up, starts directing the whole deliverance. You see mir miracles happen. A miracle takes place and that person changes. They get a halo. They get that halo effect to just brighten right up. Um, but a lot of what the uh, the exorcists on the on the show had described, um, uh, I believe, is just either of their own making or it just doesn't sound right at all. Um, for one, I wasn't impressed by uh, Bishop James Long's uh, stories at all. There was, uh, in fact, the second story that he talked about really uh, was more taken from the movie or the story of The Exorcist than it was uh, his own story. Um, there's too many similarities. The other is, is that, you know, he said that you can't look in the eyes of the possessed. Maybe an extreme case, but that rarely ever happens. I look in the eyes of the possessed all the time when I'm doing deliverance and exorcism. Just for the fact that they, the demon can see Jesus looking back at them. Because Jesus lives inside the Christian. Um... Uh, this whole thing that of demonic venom, I believe it was uh, Reverend James, I think his name was, or Steve, I, I can't remember. Uh, the guy with a lot of tattoos, which, I, well, d demons, <laughs> demons see, and they've admitted to this, that, that the blood that is brought out of a tattoo they see that as a blood sacrifice. So why I, there's an exorcist with tattoos. Oh, I just kind of question that. Um, this whole thing of demonic venom, um, I started laughing because I never heard of that before. Uh, now, demons, they don't have, they have word venom, you could say. They, they speak to somebody, they tap to somebody, you can see that as venom. That's spiritual, but the the physical aspects of it. Now, demons can uh, teleport an object from one place to another, and that's probably what happened in this minister's case was the fact that it had teleported maybe some oil or um, some sort of toxin or whatever and threw it at him, you know, teleported it and then threw it at him. That, that's believable. I would believe that. That's probably more than likely what happened. Um, so I have seen on cases stuff come up missing. 
you know, sets of, of objects coming up missing, that kind of thing, and then they teleport them back. Um, uh, the haunted objects. Uh, you could really see the experience of these exorcists on the show with the whole haunted objects type of thing. Again, demons have to attach themselves to something that is done through occult-wise or some sort of extreme uh, emotional aspect of it, and then they, but they prefer. I'll say this again: they prefer bodies. And if they can get a chance, they will split off a portion of themselves and put them into the person who has emotional issues. Um, but they're going to stay behind in the object or in the person just for the fact that they're greedy. They want everything. They want to take over everything. So they're going to slice off a portion of themselves and put them in other things and other people. Um, that that gets me to one of their stories where <clears throat> I believe it was Rita's, where there's a mother and a daughter having you know they believe that the demon was jumping to different people. Okay, they're their daughters. For one, the the mother is the legal authority figure, and from a young age, if the mother has done something to get a demon it is going to split off and go into the children prior to the age of maturity 18 and then at that they're, they're going to stay there until something something occurs now I've had cases where the where father, son, a daughter, or mother, son, daughter, they're both under possessed. You know, the, the father usually accuses the, the the child of having something, and after review, something pops up out of the the parent, and then at the same time, something pops up out of the the daughter. I've had witnesses say, "Why is that? Why is it jumping?" I'm like, "It's not jumping. It's the same spirit." It's the same spirit in the person. But one case I've had, a very good example of this, and uh, was in Ben County. We had a mass deliverance last year, and the, the I was originally going to do an exorcism on on the mother, and but what happened was the. Um, she was being very avoidant, and she was actually throwing some of my stuff uh, because it was holy. The demons didn't like that. Um, so we took a break from her and started on the daughter. And kind of people were like, well, why are you going to do that? You know, when the demons are in the mother. Well, it's the same spirit. And I showed it and um, had her break a Jezebel type curse that's related to Jezebel. And uh, she started laughing, and the mother started laughing. I'm like there you go, there's the there's the spirit it's just possessing both people at the same time, because it has split off, and went into the daughter, and so that's how, that's how that works. And so it was kind of laughable that you know they were thinking that that it was jumping from one person to the other when it, actually they don't do that they don't jump they're just they go into they're already there it's just they're dormant mm. until something happens mm. and then uh, um, so that kind of goes back to the haunted object thing is uh, I would have to question Long and Rita's knowledge on haunted objects. For one thing, why does Long have a vault of haunted objects? Get rid of those. I mean, I have people that try to give me haunted objects, and I don't want them. I, you know, they they have attachments. Get rid of them. Bury them. Bind the bind the spirit. Throw them in the trash. I have a friend who lives who who, who works for a landfill in the county, and uh, he says, "Yeah, I assure you that everything gets buried, and you're never gonna see it again." So, 
And this another thing is if you have multi have emotional issues that's going on, deep issues, even before you become an exorcist, you gotta get those taken care of or else you can have a dissociative that has a lot of pain that you may not know about and get attachments uh, you know, after an exorcism. They can go into you. Um, and which I believe is what, what has happened to Long and Rita. If you watch those episodes, the first, it's the first two episodes, or in the first episode, um, Long has this Tao, and um, he starts to see the crowd differently. Well, that right there is a sign that would tell me, which would tell me as an exorcist, that, okay, I you would need to, to talk to me because you, I believe you have something. In the same case as Rita's. Now, you that out there that, you know, in the paranormal or listen to this, you're probably laughing. But as I mentioned before, I have a transparent ministry and anybody is invited to an exorcism. If you're in Michigan, I actually have a couple coming up. Now, with the haunted objects, again, you can't touch them if you have emotional issues because they're going to split off and they're going to go into you. Now, also keep in mind that this ministry interrogates demons for information. We want to know how the enemy works, how the enemy operates, and what they're doing in darkness. And at the right time, when they are at their weakest, then they are susceptible to bringing the truth through the Holy Spirit, they're going to tell the truth. That's what we do. So how do you think I know all this stuff? So I don't prescribe to the Catholic method. I think the Catholic method of exorcism needs to be changed. It's a heathen prayer. God doesn't hear heathen prayers according to his word. And uh, it is an emotional issue. Now, I'm not, I'm not bashing. Now, before you Catholics come at me, for one, I have family who are Catholic. I have friends who are Catholic. And they've even sat down on in my deliverances and exorcisms to and observe things. And um, they, they can attest that it works. The method that I use is, uh, actually works. So um, what we concentrate on is making the demons say an oath. I know that the, the Catholic rite of exorcism doesn't particularly do that. There's a lot of psalms involved. There's a lot of you know reading of prayers, that kind of thing. But a lot of the methods that the Protestants or evangelicals use is very similar to the Catholic Church method. Um, it's just that what the Protestants always wanted to do is get back to the original church. And that's kind of what we're doing. As we're looking back in time to see what the, what the original church did and their methods. And of course we get, we get the word exorcism from an oath. And we know that in the banishment method that the early church used, they actually made the demons say an oath to God of their own banishment and they had to leave. But a lot of, a lot of times today, um, in some, even as there's a problem in the, in, the, in the Protestant church that there are some pastors who would just say, hey, get out, demon, get out, get out, and just keep saying that, and by authority of Christ, get out. That demon's not going anywhere when it has a legal right. So um, then they'll just hide and pretend like they left. And then I've had cases like that where I had to clean up after pastors and the demon pops up and yeah, I, I tricked them. I really, I really got them, you know, I made them look like I, I left when I really didn't. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, so there is uh, even a, a problem in the Catholic church of the, uh, you know, the, that they have, done an exorcism, went through the uh, whole prayer system of exorcism, and it looks like it left. And 
There's been cases uh, where I've cleaned up after the Saginaw Diocese the, and other exorcists around the region that have done deliverance. And there has been Catholics, uh, I'd say this too, is the majority of the people that I do de deliverance on are actually Catholics. Why? Because they're tired of waiting through all the red tape that the Catholic Church puts them through. Um, they now I'll say this too, and you probably get mad at me, but the Catholic Church is only in the business of extreme cases, very extreme. I know that I've said this before, but <clears throat> they their idea of exorcism is things that are getting out of control, levitation, um, speaking in different languages or tongues. Uh, and knowledge of other things that are mysterious, you know. Uh, but the but that is that is an extreme case, and the very minor cases still have psychiatrists look at or psychologists look at do uh, those, those evaluations. And there's a waiting list, and it's a, it's a lot of red tape. Oh, you don't have any demons. You just have. You just need to go see the psychologist and get this figured out. When they actually could have demons, because the demons have started the process of breaking down their will. So that's what we do. That's what we're looking at is to to heal the soul and to get them out before they do any any damage and it becomes an extreme case. So that's what this ministry does. So overall, the Legion of Exorcists, I give it two out of five stars. The reason for that is because it's, um, one, there's a lot of Hollywood involved. Tone it down a bit. And because it's it's too Hollywoody and too, you know, too unbelievable. Um, and it makes the each exorcist uh, case that they talk about um, a laughing stock. And also get some authentic exorcists because, I mean, I know a few on there that are just, they're not real at all by any means. And there's actually people in the paranormal community who are getting sick of seeing one particular exorcist on TV too much, representing exorcists at large in the paranormal community. And you know who you are. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of people know that I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to name names. So that's that's my evaluation. Um, go ahead and laugh all you want. And again, if you're in Michigan and I have a case, you're welcome to sit in. We play exorcisms on this podcast for a reason. One, two evangelize to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because the original church did exorcisms in public and it was there according to other scholars and theologians it was the number one miracle that they performed the pastor would go out into the crowd open air preach and the congregation went into the crowd evangelized demons came forward to confront them and they would cast them out. It was spiritual warfare. The demons would of of Rome, of Greece, other regions and province of the Roman Empire would go into the authority and tempt them to go and kill the, to kill the Christians, which they did. So it was spiritual warfare and the church kept at it, kept at it, kept at it all the way up until <clears throat> Constantine and his Edict of Milan. And once that was passed, Christianity became the authoritative religion in all, the Ro all, all of Rome, Rome, the Roman Empire. And uh, because the church felt that it had won, then it, it ceased all activity, very minor scale. I think we know this because it was more talked about because uh, it was, uh, whereas, the early church, first, second, and third centuries, they did it more commonly because 
And we don't you know, we don't want to hear about it because it was done more commonly among Christians. Every Christian knew how, knew how to do it, so it was very common. So you didn't really talk about it. But uh, as time progressed and Constantine made his Edict of Milan, we then start seeing records of early church fathers and philosophers start talking about it, writing it down more because it was a rarity. Um, then it just disappeared over time. But later on, I commend the Catholic Church for being the, the first branch of Christianity to actually bring it back, and but in a different form. So the, the original method needs to be gone back to and reforged. And that's what this ministry believes that we do as we go back to the original method and how it was used and how it was done. Um, so if you want to learn learn this method and learn what we do, I am setting up a Patreon page for training. And uh, your monthly uh, gift or membership on it, you know, you it will help this ministry to get out more and to to bow more more demons and uh, will support this ministry. Um, so we ahead of time we appreciate your your gift. Um, so that's all I got for today. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a, a review of the Legion of Exorcist, and uh, but so I just kind of wanted to snuff out some of the myths also. Um, so that just kind of shows you the experience level of these exorcists that are on the show. I found, I believe his name was Pastor Scott, the guy with the, the blazer, and uh, Pastor Donnie, more credible than the others on the show. Um, their cases are actually very accurate. So if you want to see actual um, what stuff the exorcists go through, go back and watch any episodes where they tell their stories, and those are more credible than the others. The the others I just I couldn't I couldn't sit there and believe what the what they were telling. Um, I just uh, made me cock my head, and it re really their stories more hurt the. Uh, exorcist in the paranormal community than than anything else and uh, so it's very sad uh, especially one telling his story that is very similar to the the exorcist which <laughs> which was la laughable <laughs> uh, so this is GP Haggard signing off uh, have a blessed day God bless you and uh, stay strong